I'm not sure what I'm going to talk about either, so I thought I'd write down some notes. <laughs> I want to start by making an announcement, which is that professional wrestling is fake. <laughs> now, now, many of you knew that before you got here, but this person over here, I could tell, heard it for the first time. And what's interesting when you hear that is, we can take this down, you already saw it, we, um, is it changes the way you look at the sport. Like one day, you thought it was real, and then the next day, you realized it wasn't. And once you realized it wasn't, once you were able to look at it differently, you noticed the blood packs, you noticed that people were pulling their punches, you felt differently about cheering for people because you saw them as an actor instead of an athlete. And I think that one of the magic elements of a conference like this, particularly if you've come to it more than once, is it changes the way you see things. And once you see things differently, you're inspired or almost required to act differently. So what I want to do today is just put up a couple things that maybe you haven't seen or you have seen and haven't heard said quite the same way. Because I think it's very important, particularly for the, uh, for the activists and the smart people in this room, to act differently. So the first thing I want to talk about is this. Politics and democracy are two different things. And it's called the Personal Democracy Forum, but a lot of the discussion is about politics. And I have spent some time with politicians. And what you understand about politics is politics is about calculation, and it's about the short term. And it's about winning, and it's about winning today. And when you see what happens at campaigns on every side of the political spectrum is the last day of the campaign is the going out of business sale. And no one really pays any attention to what's going to happen five days later. Because if you lose, it doesn't matter. And if you win, it doesn't matter. And all the resources get burned because it doesn't matter. The goal was just to get elected. And people who are in the democracy business are in a fundamentally different business. They're in the business of the long term, not the short term. And they're in the business of educating people so those people end up acting differently and causing different sorts of change over time. And so it was very interesting if you watch some of the early um, electronic things that went on, like Move On. Move On started as a, a medium, uh, an attempt to use the medium to cause some sort of democracy to happen. But it quickly shifted into a cash register for certain kinds of political activity. That's politics. That's not democracy. That's what I wanted to put out there first. The second idea is when we talk about tribes, tribes are a group of people who share a culture, who share a point of view, who can look at each other and understand they're onto something. Sometimes they have leaders, sometimes they don't, sometimes they're looking for a leader. So many of the people in this room have Apple stuff, but only some of the people in this room are in the Apple tribe. So you're in the airport, you see somebody else who's carrying the same device as you, you go, you and me. Like, what exactly do we have in common? Well, we're in sync because this profit-oriented company helped us become in sync. If we think about the civil rights movement, Martin Luther King didn't tell people in the civil rights movement what to do, but he did open the door for many of those people to do things in parallel. And one of the things that democracy does when it moves forward quickly is it galvanizes tribes. That it never gets everyone to move in the same direction at the same time, but it helps a group of people go forward. But the important thing to understand is it doesn't have to be your tribe. The, teenage, the Beatles didn't invent teenagers. They just showed up to lead them. Bob Marley did not invent the Rastafarians. He just showed up to lead them. And so the opportunity of someone who wants to make change isn't necessarily to go find a whole bunch of strangers figure out what they might have in common, invent that thing, and get them in sync. What that person has the ability to do is find a tribe, a tribe that is disconnected but needs to be connected, a tribe that is leaderless but needs to be led, and help that tribe accomplish what it wants to do. Now, both of these elements I'm talking about, the growth of democratic movements and the idea of tribes, require people, people like you, to start with a clean sheet of paper. There is no personal democracy forum for dummies in print, as far as I know. There is no step-by-step -step set of instructions about how you do this. Where is the proof? And the challenge is this. I was at 
newspaper conventions 15 years ago where people were standing up and explaining to the newspaper industry what their future was going to be like and what to do about it. And there were lots of people in that room who go to conferences for a living. And they witnessed the death of newspapers but weren't able to do anything about it. And I was at internet conferences at Internet World 15 years ago, 14 years ago, I was speaking. And you'd see people at Internet World busy taking notes. They couldn't live blog it because there was no such thing. Busy taking notes. And they were there pre-bubble, mid-bubble, post-bubble, and they're still taking notes, still waiting for the right moment. And then, of course, the minute something gets built, they say, oh, yeah, I had that idea. But they didn't do it. So here's the third giant thing I want to mention, which is this. The best-selling Lego in America, the thing that saved the Lego Corporation are Lego kits. And it makes me really sad. Because we grew up, like back in the old days when things were good, with individual pieces of Lego and you had to figure it out. You had to figure out how to build your own structure and it might not be good. And that was the key to why Lego was useful. And Lego published a list of the 12 rules of what Lego must be before they would ship it. And one of them was every piece must have multiple uses. And that got them all the way to bankruptcy or right on the edge. And they had to invent Lego kits because we have raised yet another generation that wants to be told exactly how to do it, to do the kit right. That we do not have a shortage of very many things in this room. The people in this room are privileged and trusted and have leverage, but unfortunately we are now facing a huge bravery shortage. And it's a bravery shortage because we have the tools to go start a conference, a newsletter, a community, a tribe. We have the tools to connect people, to speak up, to start movements, to make these long arc democratic changes, and we are not using them. And we're not using them because there is no manual, because there is no kit, because no one has shown us step by step by step how to do it. We are leaving the industrial economy, this economy that was based on scarcity, scarcity of real estate, scarcity of resources to build stuff. And we are moving from that to an era where it used to be we, a plant would open in town and it would hire 1,000 people. And now, of course, a plant's in town and it lays off 1,000 people. It's being replaced by the connection economy, an economy that is not based on scarcity but based on abundance, abundance of choice, based on trust, and based on generosity because no one wants to connect with someone who's just taking all the time. So the question we're going to have to ask ourselves, if we want to make a difference, and why else come here unless you want to get out of the rain, the question we have to ask ourselves is, what are we going to do? What are we going to build? What is the asset we would like to create out of thin air in this new economy of generosity? It's 1913. We're having a conference about how the assembly line works and mass production, interchangeable parts, and Henry Ford is sitting over there we know what he's going to do. What would you do if someone laid it out for you in 1913 about what was coming? Well, here it is, 2013, and we can see it laid out. It's, being ha it's happening over and over and over again. So what? Well, I, I was uh, um, in Kenya a year and a half ago, and I visited with a, a microfinance bank called Jehudi Kalimo. And what they do is they loan uh, uh, an individual enough money to buy a cow. And that cow gives off enough milk to pay off the interest, and then you can pay for the whole cow within a year. And if you go from being a subsistence farmer to a farmer with a cow, a milk cow, suddenly you go from living on the edge to being relatively rich. And if you have enough money to buy two or three, you can send your kids to college. It's a transformative event. The repayment rate on these loans is significantly higher than the repayment rate on mortgages in the United States. It's huge. And the reason it works is this. Every single loan officer for Jehudi Kalimo meets not with one person getting a loan, but a group of people, a tribe of people. And those people support each other. In fact, those people are securing each other's loans. And if someone defaults, they all have to pay it back. So there are no defaults. And they, met, they introduced me to a guy, and they said, this is the chairman. I said, what is his name? They said, we just call him the chairman, like Frank Sinatra. And he was in charge, the volunteer in charge of a group of 20 people in this tribe. And he was extraordinarily proud of his role in the community. That he 
was looked up to by that group of people. And he took me on the tour and introduced it. And every time I went to another person's house, they said, Mr. Chairman, come on in. And they had the whole conversation. So what Jehudi Kalima was able to do was merely by building connection where there had been no connection, they were able to create a change that is going to change generations to come. So yeah, there's a fork in the road. And the, as the saying goes, when you find a fork in the road, you need to take it. And my goal in coming here today was to point it out to you and say, you don't have the choice to ignore it. You either have to say, I will do nothing about this. I see all the assets, I see all the resources, but I will also look for the confusion and the risk and that I might not do the right thing. So I will just let somebody else take this fork. Or you can pick yourself and say, sure, I can do this. I don't need cash or permission or authority. Badges, we don't need no stinking badges. That what I can do instead is lead up. Figure out the people who I need to influence. I can't buy them, but I can influence them by building connection, by building a network around what I want to do and do it tomorrow. Not two years from now and seven years from now when it's my turn, but tomorrow. So last story I want to tell you in the minute I have left. There used to be a flight from White Plains to Boston, and I hated that flight. Because if I drove, I would get in traffic and think I should have flown. And if I flew, we would circle, and I would think I should have driven. So they canceled the flight, which was good. But the last time I took it, it took me 29 minutes to get to Boston, which was a win. And I got punished on the way home, and we circled the airport for a really long time. And we made an emergency landing in Albany, and the pilot says we're going to be on the ground for an hour and a half till midnight. I said, that's ridiculous. So I go online to Avis, and I rent a car, four-seater. And I stand up in the plane, and I say, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not a psychopath. I'm wearing a tie. My car is in White Plains, so is yours. I'm driving home. Who wants a ride? It's free. It's on me. No one raised their hand. <laughs> as far as I know, they're still in Albany. <laughs> and I had the whole ride home to think about why. And here's the reason why. The reason why is if you stay on the plane, it's United Airlines' fault. And if you get off the plane, it's your fault. And you were raised to blame United Airlines. And what I'm hoping you will do is get off the damn plane. Thank you very much.